So I'm probably going to recommend you do put your headphones on because otherwise it's, it, it is a bit weird with the background noise. I feel like someone's going to say, you're on mute any moment now. Um, but um, I come at this from a sort of weird, weird angle in that I'm, I've been a copywriter, really, a direct marketing copywriter first. Uh, I've been an advertising creative for about 20 or 30 years. But I actually did maths quite seriously at school. My brother's an astrophysicist. And I think there's this artificial divide between math men and mad men that's been created that's actually unhelpful. Because if you delve deeper into the real maths of human behavior, complex systems and so forth, you discover actually that it's much, much more interesting. It's much, much less narrow than people like to pretend. And there are lots and lots of interesting mathematical findings in marketing. There's obviously, uh, to take one example, uh, there's the work of um, Byron Sharp, there's the Ehrenberg Bass Institute, there's the famous Bass Diffusion Curve, which shows the sigmoid shape of the adoption of any technology. What you discover about marketing maths is it's non-linear, it's non-proportionate. In other words, small things can have very large effects. And it's complex. There are interdependencies. There are recursive loops. So the attempt to capture marketing by mad math men who are simply using the maths of Newtonian physics is actually a completely unwarranted and unrealistic power grab. Now, when I talk about risk, I'm not really going to talk about risk. I'm going to talk about probability because it's a much, much healthier uh, line of conversation. If you say to anybody in business what we're doing is a risk, they automatically start framing it as a negative. I think to be realistic, you have to talk about probability in this field. I think that's just inescapable, because I don't think we live in a world of complete certainty. And there's a very good reason for that, by the way, which is what we deal with as marketers is the future. And the future is to some degree unknowable. In fact, the only thing you can confidently say is the future is going to be very different from the past. And the speed at which change happens varies. Sometimes next year is pretty similar to this year. At other times, you have something, for example, a pandemic uh, or uh, you know, a, a global inflation crisis, which means that actually the future is unrecognizably different. And one of the mistakes we make is, and I, I, I was very happy because some mathematicians actually quoted me on this, and I'm not used to being quoted by mathematicians. When I said that the problem with big data is that all big data comes from the same place, the past, I found myself being re-quoted by various mathematicians because the first rule of mathematical statistics is if there's anything unrepresentative about your sample set, you've got to compensate for it. And there is something inherently unrepresentative about big data in marketing, which is all of it looks at what happened last year rather than what's going to happen next year or in five years' time. Now, when I talk about risk, there is a fundamental problem which marketers face where anybody who's dealing with probabilistic outcomes has to face in business, which is that businesses become disproportionately risk averse. And I've got a fantastic story about this which explains why it is so. If you think about it, okay, the downside cost of a bad decision to any individual in a business is you lose your job, you damage your reputation, you become long-term unemployable. The upside opportunity, unlike, say, in banking, let's be honest, isn't all that great. You know, I always said of jokingly of Ogilvy that if I discovered a cure for cancer, they'd probably name a small meeting room after me. On the other hand, if I negotiated up the Unilever blended annual rate by 0.3%, they'd carry me into the fucking office in a palanquin, OK? Um, that actually, What's interesting, and this is a really interesting story of Daniel Kahneman, he's speaking to the board of directors of a large American company. We don't know which one, we think it's probably GE. And he goes round the table to eight of the heads of the GE's biggest divisions. I don't know what those are, big metal things, finance, lighting, you know, aircraft engines, whatever it may be, okay? And he says to each of them in turn, okay, I can offer you a decision where there's a 50% chance that next year your revenue and profits will go up by 50%, but there's a 30% chance that next year your revenue and profits will go down by 30%. Okay? 50% chance of a 50% gain, 30% chance of a 30% loss. 
And all but two of the eight people said, I wouldn't take those odds. And he said, why not? On balance, they're favorable odds. And they said, I know, on balance, they're favorable odds. But one time in three, I'm going to lose my job. And the chief executive is sitting at the end of the table and he goes, but I want all of you to take that risk because in aggregate, we'd end up well ahead. Okay, we'd have, you know, two out of six divisions would probably lose a bit of money. But if four of the eight divisions are actually making 50% more money, we're quids in. And that's a fundamental asymmetry which we often fail to notice in business. Now, interestingly, bees have solved for that problem, okay? Now, I'm sorry to talk about this, but it's important. Bees have a brilliant system called the Waggle Dance, where they share information on where there's a source of nectar or pollen or resin, which I think are the three things that bees collect. But bee scientists were slightly surprised to discover that although, you know, many, many bees under certain circumstances are fairly assiduous in following the Waggle Dance and collecting pollen from a source where they know pollen already exists, about 20% of bees go off at random. And they're kind of dilettante bees. And given that bees have been around for 20 million years, they're quite a lot older than humans, the bee scientists thought this was really odd because they thought, you know, in 20 million years of bee evolution, surely we would have sort of evolved bee compliance officers who'd effectively say, no, 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 we need higher levels of compliance with the Waggle Dance to bring our pollen and nectar collection targets in line with our forecast for quarter three. But bees still indulge a certain proportion of the bee population. It varies. When I say 20%, that's a very, very gross generalisation. But bees still indulge a certain number of bees to just go off at random. And the scientists asked why, and they suddenly discovered something which actually in AI is known as the explore-exploit trade-off. There's information you know and there's information you don't know, either because you never knew it in the first place or because it's new information. Any efficient, surviving, robust organization has to accept the fact that there's a trade-off between exploiting what you already know and discovering what you don't yet know, i.e. something that's changed, something that's new, or something that had just never occurred to you before. Now, if bees had personality, well, I don't think bees have much personality, I may be doing them a huge disservice there. If you think about it, the obedient bees would get really fucked off with the dilettante bees, wouldn't they? They go, here am I, every single journey, right? You know, energy expended in collection is 25% less than energy recovered in nectar, pollen, other forms of energy. In every single journey I make actually pays. And there you are, basically pissing off at random, like a load of dilettantes. Most of your journeys, as far as I can see, are a total waste of time. And the fact is, of course, that's true. Most of them are. They're not very productive. But maybe one journey in 50, a dilettante bee stumbles on a completely new source of foodstuffs. And if he goes back, and there's a vital if here, if he then goes back and shares that information with the rest of the hive, that information, that waggle dance he does, is literally 100 times more valuable than a standard waggle dance, which is simply telling the hive about information they already knew. And what the bee scientists discovered, if you don't have the dilettante bees, there are two problems. One of which is you can't really grow. You can't get lucky because you're exclusively optimized on what you already know. Secondly, you become hugely vulnerable to a change in the environment because if some cows break into your favorite field and eat all the flowers, suddenly you've got nowhere left to go. And I often talk, by the way, about business policies which are a bit like that. They're over-optimised on one model. One thing that always frightens the shit out of me is any business that's subscription dependent. And the reason for that is, OK, you've got lots and lots of news publications, Netflix, you know, television publications, which are all dependent on recurring credit card payments. Now, all it takes is one big recession or one piece of legislation which simply says, you know, recurring credit card payments have to be listed separately uh, on a credit card bill and you must be able to cancel them with a single click from your credit card bill and that whole business could die. You know, I think subscription businesses, businesses based on recurring payments are interesting but it's inherently a high risk thing on which to become exclusively dependent. In Germany they've just introduced legislation which says it must be as easy to cancel a subscription as it is to take one out at a discounted rate. 
Some piece of legislation like that could basically kill your whole business model. And so what the bees do is they're continually, effectively, refining what is their source of bee revenue. And in, uh, in foraging and in artificial intelligence, this is known as the exploit-explore trade-off. The huge danger is, is that exploitation is predictable and reliable and is a good career move. Exploration in the short term looks like a cost. And so a business that is run to short-term preoccupations, where it's only interested in the efficient optimization of what is already known, looks like a really great business. The bees would have a great couple of weeks if all they did was obey the waggle dance. In the first two or three or four weeks of activity, 100% compliance with the waggle dance would probably be a good move. There probably were bees that did that. The reason there aren't any more is because they all died out. They became over-optimized on the past, they became effectively trapped in a local maximum, and they died out. Evolution took care of that problem. That's why the only bees that survive have a certain R&D function, okay? Without that R&D function, without that adaptability to a changing environment, there are those bees that couldn't do that, that couldn't adapt, don't exist anymore. And this is, um, I, I'm fanboying this by a bit, guy a bit. Is anybody familiar? Put your hands up if you do. With a guy called Roger L. Martin, Canadian business guru. Okay, one person knows him. Uh, get to read his books. There's a new one called A New Way to Think. He's an absolutely brilliant um, a business thinker from a marketing perspective. In other words, he's kind of the heir to Peter Drucker. And I really recommend reading him. And he makes this great point that businesses feel really comfortable doing something which is called planning. Because planning only deals with the things you can control. You know, your factory size, what you invest in this. Strategy, however, is about how on earth you optimize value creation among people you can't control, which is customers, using an interesting mixture of the things you can control. Whether that's marketing, R&D, manufacturing, pricing, or everything else. And because of that asymmetry I mentioned, I mentioned that Daniel Kahneman asymmetry, which is that, if you think about it, if you, if you, if you do something which makes your, your employer millions and millions of pounds, you'll probably get a pat on the back. And if you do something which loses your employer 20,000 pounds, you lose your job. It is not safe to assume that the incentives and interests of individual employees are necessarily well aligned with the interests of the organization. This is a brilliant quote from Kumal Galhotra, who's the head of Ford North America. It's an acknowledgement that most people in business are involved in rational planning of things entirely within their control. That's what most of management is, okay? That's what most board discussion is about. It's about effectively optimizing those things that are immediately within your field of control. The fundamental problem is what your business depends on is a customer whose behavior can only be influenced obliquely. It can't be controlled in any kind of capitalist democratic economy. You can't tell your customers what to buy. And this is a wonderful quote, I think, from Kumal Galhotra. Interesting man, because he grew up in India, where even owning any car was a luxury good. Um, in his street, there were two cars out of 20 houses. And now he's in charge of Ford North America. Something like that, I think, gives you a really interesting perspective. Car making, he said, is 100,000 rational decisions in search of one emotional decision. And I think there's a problem, because the obsession with planning, quantification, rational argument, means that we are automatically constrained to doing those things which make sense in advance. The fundamental thing about any kind of creative idea, any kind of interesting insight, it's the uncovering of something which is only visible in retrospect. There isn't an absolutely linear, logical process by which you can actually arrive at a genuine insight or a genuine creative idea. Now, if you want to go into the philosophy of this, read a bit more Roger L. Martin. Uh, there's a very interesting guy called Charles Sanders Peirce, who is a 19th century American philosopher, possibly the most interesting American writer or thinker of the 19th century. Bit of a nutter, so he, he, uh, he, he was always effectively, he never achieved quite the eminence he deserved, who made exactly this point, that there is a necessary mental function which he calls effectively abductive inference, which involves some leap of the imagination. It's not a question about what is, 
It's a different question, which is what would have to be true in order for this to happen? And the answer to that question cannot be arrived at simply through pure induction or deduction. It requires some effort of subjective imagination. And Peirce made the point that this is basically unavoidable. And my contention is that the number of ideas you'll arrive at by simply looking at what is, particularly by looking at past focused data about what is, is a tiny proportion of the subset of all possible ideas. And it's particularly true in business because if you become focused only on those ideas which are easy to justify in advance, okay, the likelihood is that all your competitors are busily engaged in doing those things already. So the likelihood that you'll actually distinguish yourself or differentiate yourself by being purely logical is limited. But just as I said, you know, culturally, the obedient bees probably would hate the dilettante bees if they had a personality. To anybody who's engaged in planning, the act of speculative strategy seems self-indulgent. They don't understand that actually the two are interdependent. That there's no point in explore if you don't exploit, but there's no value to exploit, or there's a danger to pure exploit if you don't actually trade off and spend a bit of time in explore. And understanding the complementarity and circularity of those processes. By the way, one of the things I think that interests me is the explore bees are only valuable if they share what they find. If they go and discover a completely new field of pollen and they keep it to themselves, okay, the system completely breaks down. It only works because the explore bees are happy to dance when they discover something new. Very interestingly, the length of the dance is proportionate to the significance of the find. Now, the bees don't actually watch how long a bee is dancing for. It's simply that the longer you dance, the more bees notice you. So the more bees then follow your discovery. It's a very, very clever um, feedback loop, which is done very, very simply. But the length of the dance, the duration of the dance, is proportionate to the significance of the find. If you found a massive great field of pollen, the buggers will dance for ages. Now, <coughs> my point here, OK, is do not think that incentives in business... And one of the worst things that happened in business, I think, is that everybody has their own set of targets. Everybody has to have this mechanistic bonus and reward system, which is based on key metrics which are determined in advance. And the metrics tend to be dangerously biased. One, because metrics are always biased, because there isn't a numerical value for lots of things. So you end up making important those things you can measure rather than measuring those things that are important. And one of the things I always notice in business is there's no real metric or incentive scheme for information sharing. If you have a sales force, my hunch is that if any salesman in that sales force happens to stumble on an interesting new way to sell the product, the odds are they're going to keep it to themselves. Because your job security is better determined by outperforming your competitors than it is by enriching the whole organisation. And it strikes me as fundamentally problematic that we incentivise people according to what they do themselves, okay, rather than the contribution they make to the wider system as a whole. In a properly bonused and incentivised business world, sharing a valuable bit of information with other people should be the most highly rewarded activity there is. Why? Because in that B system, the most valuable thing you can do is discover a new field of pollen and then share the information with the rest of the hive. And yet, interestingly, we basically asked the question, Oi, you, B, how much pollen did you collect this week? Because if it's zero, you're fucking fired, right? Right? OK, we, we attach immediate short-term measures. We give great weights to those, whereas the longer-term contribution is basically not rewarded at all. And that strikes me as dangerous. Now, there's a bit of weird maths in this. Anybody heard of ergodicity? My PA is groaning at the back. It's, it's an important concept, OK? Because we tend to assume that the short-term aggregate average is the same as the individual um, over time experience. So let's take, this is from Ole Peters, who's the kind of father of ergodicity economics, OK? Let's take a simple bet. You put all your money into a pot, and then you continually toss a coin. And every time you toss a coin, your net, and, and get a heads, your net wealth goes up by 50%. Every time you toss a coin and get tails, your net wealth falls by 40%. 
and you basically let the stake roll, okay? Heads means 50% richer, tails means 40% poorer, right? Now, most people would say, yeah, I'm going to take that bet. And if you look at what you might call the aggregate, the ensemble effect of one throw, 10 people taking that bet, on average, will end up richer, okay? On average. Let's break it down one person at a time, okay? Let's start with 100 pounds. First throw, heads, you get 150 quid. Tails, you get 60, okay? On average, you're worth 105 quid. But that only works if you share the money and share the risk. You only get 105 quid if you're actually sharing the risk with the other participant, right? Second throw, one guy, heads, 225 quid. Heads, tails gets you 90. Tails, heads gets you 90. Tails, tails, you're down to 36 quid from your initial stake of 100 pounds. You've now got to throw three heads in a row to get your initial stake back. You basically want to know in technical terms is a bit fucked, okay? But the average wealth, because largely because of this person at the top, has become so inordinately richer by throwing heads twice in a row, the average wealth is now £110.25, okay? Third throw. Heads, heads, heads. This guy's off to the races, right? 337. Then you get three people with 135, you get three people with 54, and you get one poor sod with £21.60. Now, what is interesting in all these cases is, in every single um, occurrence, the majority of people end up poorer than when they started. So should you take that bet if someone offers it to you? The answer is no, you shouldn't take that bet. When you should take that bet is say, I'm going to form a consortium of 50 people to share the risk, and we're going to all take that bet with a prior agreement to share the winnings amongst ourselves, and we're going to end, we're, and then in which case, throw the coin as many times as you bloody well like, we're, we're going to make a fortune here. We're going to make 5% every coin throw. But it doesn't work on an individual level. This guy is seriously messed up. And so, one of the interesting things, and this is what Daniel Kahneman discovered, is that when you individualize risk, you make individuals too risk averse. The point of an organization, the reason we form companies, must in part be we can be that little bit braver individually if we pool wins and losses than we can be if everybody basically acts like an independent entity. And yet most of the way we incentivize behavior is exclusively on individual behavior. And as a result, you end up with this extraordinary loss aversion within business behavior. And it's probably best encapsulated in that famous thing, which was never actually an advertising slogan, but it was just the phrase, no one ever got fired for buying IBM, okay? The way I always describe the difference between B2C marketing and B2B marketing is that in B2C marketing, when people make a purchase, they're trying to minimize the risk of regret, okay? They're kind of asking, what could, what's the worst that can happen? I don't want to spend this money and end up with something bad happening. I always argue that's why brands command a premium. Because it's not that brands are necessarily a proof of superiority on average, but they do reduce the perceived risk of shittiness. Okay? McDonald's isn't the most successful restaurant in the world because it's a really good restaurant. It's the most successful restaurant in the world because it's really, really good at not being terrible, right? You know, say what you like about the Golden Arches, okay? You know, okay, it's not going to get a Michelin star. But you never get ripped off, the toilets are always pretty clean, the food's always pretty edible, and you don't get the shits. You know, I mean, one of the things that really annoys me is now airports have become poncy, right? You never get a bloody McDonald's or a KFC. At the, now, when I'm going to board a plane for 10 hours, the principal requirement I have for a meal is that it doesn't make me ill, right? So why on earth they have seafood and, and raw seafood restaurants at, at airports strikes me as a form of insanity, okay? So what tends to happen is by making everybody individually responsible for their part of the business, the net overall effect is you create a business which is more risk averse than it needs to be and could actually grow more if people were prepared to do a degree of risk pooling. And I don't think they do. I mean, if you look at how, you know, advertising agency holding groups are run, effectively, everybody, there's no R&D function, there's no R&D budget, everybody's just responsible for their own revenue. And if you share valuable information, no one cares. It's a terrible system.
OK? Payment by the hour is a bloody catastrophe, if you ask me. So here's an interesting problem, which is effectively two things. I think good risk advice is bad career advice. When I talk about McDonald's, I think that's why there are four big accounting firms, right? It's because if you appoint one of the big four accounting firms and something goes wrong, everybody blames them. If you appoint a small boutique accounting firm and something goes wrong, everybody blames you for not appointing Price Waterhouse, right? We suddenly discovered we couldn't understand why British Airways had so little success launching flights from London City to New York, which were a brilliant proposition to a rational passenger. And then we realized it's the intermediary effect, right? Because your PA or the company travel agent, when they book you on a flight to New York, their principal motivation is not optimizing your experience, it's avoiding the risk of blame. It's avoiding the risk of being shouted at. Now, if you put your boss on a flight from Heathrow to JFK, which is the default, if anything goes wrong, your boss will blame British Airways, right? Because you've just, you haven't made a decision, you've just gone with a boring default. Heathrow, JFK, British Airways, you know, 10, 15 a.m., right? If you put your boss on a flight out of Newark, which I think is a better airport than JFK, does anybody else agree? Yeah. Jersey, can't go wrong, I totally agree. Also, by the way, good tip if you use Newark, um, book an Uber Lux, and then you get a Cadillac Escalade with blacked out windows, and you drive through New Jersey in a blacked out Cadillac, you feel a bit like Tony Soprano. So that's an additional bonus, okay? Now, the interesting thing is, if you book your boss out of Newark, or you book your boss out of London City, it's probably a better decision, but if anything goes wrong, it isn't British Airways who gets blamed, it's you, because you took an eccentric decision. And so, your boss can't ring you up and go, what the hell were you thinking booking me on a flight from the world's second busiest international airport, right? That would sound stupid, okay? You can't be blamed for Heathrow. London City, on the other hand, you can get the phone call which said, if you hadn't booked me for this fucking toy town airport, I'd be in New York by now, right? So what you understand is that the asymmetry of blame and reward is so great in business, it effectively makes business decisions boring, okay? People default to boring, People default to rational, people default to mainstream all the time because it minimizes the risk of blame. Why do you think meetings are so common in business? It's blame diffusion, right? If 10 people make a decision and you say we were all in the room, no one's ever gonna get you, you can't blame all 10 people, right? If one person makes a decision, their job's on the line. I mean, that blame diffusion doesn't always work. Uh, we lost uh, a big bit of business in Ogilvy about 12 years ago, and, D and Martin Sorrell rang up and said, who's responsible for this abominable business loss? And the head of the account said, uh, we're taking collective responsibility, Martin. We're all to blame. Uh, Martin replied, that's good, so I can fire lots of people. But generally, generally, OK, collective decisions are safe because what you're doing is you're minimising the risk that the blame comes to land on you. And that's why we hold so many meetings. It's not because they arrive at better decisions, they probably arrive at worse or less interesting decisions. But it's blame diffusion. And I think there's a fundamental problem, which is that if we're honest about business, business is much more Darwinian, it's much more bee-like than we ever recognise. A lot of it's luck, a lot of it's survivorship bias. Nassim Taleb, my friend Nassim, is very good on this. He said, it's very easy to look at the restaurant business and go, gosh, look at all these restaurants making a fortune. The restaurant business looks really easy. That's because in the sight of a successful restaurant, three prior restaurants went broke. But as Nassim says, the graveyard of dead restaurants is a very silent place. We don't notice the failures. We only notice the survivors and the successes. And most business is, I think, much more like that than we realise much more arbitrary, it's much more evolutionary, it's much more Darwinian than we like to admit. We like to pretend that the success in business is entirely down to elements within our direct control. A large part of it isn't, but a large part of effort in business is basically devoted to the pretense of kind of, uh, of, of what you might call cause and effect. We, we, we saw this, we did this, this happened, okay? Awful lot of the time, what happens is, I think, totally random. Let, let's take a few examples, OK? Now, one advantage of being old is you can actually... One great advantage of being, what am I, 56, is there are a lot of brands and a lot of behaviours where I can remember the before and the after. Because I'm old enough. I can remember pre-Starbucks, right? And I can actually remember going, this is really fucking weird. 
There are a lot of people paying $5 for a coffee and they're walking around with it in the streets, okay? What a weird thing to do. My brother was in Berkeley, California, where there was a place called Cafe Strada, which was in, some people think, was the kind of Fonzette Origo, the kind of originating place which gave the idea uh, for Starbucks. It was apparently the most lucrative uh, cafe real estate anywhere in the United States. My brother goes in there as a Brit in 1992, and the person in front of him in the queue says, I want a half regular, half decaf latte with low fat milk. And what you've got to understand is in 1992, if you'd said that in a British cafe, the response would have been very simple. It would have, included, it would have been two words, and the second one would have been off. You can have white coffee, you can have black coffee. Yeah. Now, all of these things, I think, make no fucking sense in advance. Five guys, we're going to charge 12, 11 pounds for a burger in a restaurant environment which is no more exotic than a McDonald's, OK? And they're going to be sacks of potatoes around the place. Red Bull, let's imagine you rationally said, we're going to compete with Coke. So obviously, if we want to compete with Coke, we need to have a drink that tastes nicer than Coke, costs less than Coke, and comes in a really big can, so people make, you know, get great value for money. A lot of refreshment per dollar. What's the most successful attempt to compete with Coke? Well, it's this. It comes in a tiny can, it costs a fortune, and it tastes disgusting, okay? Now, if you did a bit of investigation into psychology, what you discover is that practically every new successful drink starts off as a drug. Coffee was sold as a medicine, tea was sold as a medicine, Pepsi is eupeptic cola, it was sold as a stomach set, uh, settling thing, Coke was sold as containing basically Coke, right? Now, let's look at a few more. Starbucks made no sense in advance. There was no, absolutely nothing that the regular bees, nothing that the obedient bees obeying the waggle dance had as a data source would have justified charging $5 for a cup of coffee. Let, let's take another, Nando's I don't understand. I just let my kids go there. I genuinely can't understand it. I can't understand the rubric. But to my kids, it seems to have some sort of weird cultish value, which I don't fully understand. I think it may be a bit the weird mixture of paying in advance and then buying things separately afterwards. Is it that young kids are anxious in restaurants if you've got to pay at the end? I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. Five guys, I think I can make a bit of sense of it. You make the burger really expensive, but you're really generous with everything else. Free refills, free extra scoop of fries, free peanuts, the toppings they don't charge for, right? I think there's something really clever about the psychology of pricing in Five Guys. I think it's kind of a work of genius. Okay, miso soup, right? Now, if miso soup didn't exist and your kid said, hey, dad, I've just invented a new kind of soup, right? And they came in with this thing with a few white cubes in it, with a strange dishwasher taste and a leaf. I don't think you'd say, hey, don't worry about the day job, your future lies in soup development, right? But it's a massively successful thing. Why? Probably because there's a story to it. Nothing other than that. OK? And then Dyson. If James Dyson had come to me in, let's say, 1996, and he said, I think there's a market for a £600 vacuum cleaner, I would have gone, Jim... <laughs> James, mate, let's, let's have a look at this, right? You've got Miller at the top end, Henry at the bottom end. It's a nice little kind of, you know, normal distribution. There is nothing here to suggest there's a market for a £600 vacuum cleaner. But in any case, it's a distressed purchase, right? No one buys a vacuum cleaner for fun. The only reason you buy one is because your old one breaks or because your parents force you to move out so you can't use theirs, OK? And finally, anybody who can afford 600 quid for a vacuum cleaner, well, they probably employ a cleaner anyway, so they don't even do their own hoovering. All perfectly good arguments against launching Dyson, except he's a billionaire and I'm not. If he then said, I'd said, Jim, mate, you're mad. If James Dyson had then said, but wait, you haven't heard about my 400 pound hairdryer, I would have had him escorted off the premises as an obvious lunatic, okay? None of these things make sense in advance. They only make sense in retrospect. And this is why you need the explore-exploit trade-off. Because if all you do is exploit, you can only do the things that make sense in advance. The best ideas only make sense in retrospect. And as a creative person, I'm fascinated by this, which is things where um, it's only when the idea is explained to you that you go, why did that never occur to me before? So I used to travel a lot, and I used to take tons of these plug adapters. Because I'd have to charge vapes, I'd have to charge my laptop, I'd have to charge my mobile phone. 
It took me 12 years of traveling before I realized if you buy one of these mofos, you only need to take one adapter and you can plug that into a spare plug in the hotel room, which means you can actually charge all your devices without having to turn off the standard lamp and stop the tele working, right? But for some reason, it was 10 years before I solved that problem. If anybody's having their kitchen done, get two dishwashers, right? And you're looking at me at the moment going, this guy's a wanker. Why on earth would you get two dishwashers? The reason is if you've got two dishwashers, you never need to empty the dishwasher. You don't lose any storage space. You put your dirty plates in one dishwasher until it's full. Then you turn it on. That's now your clean dishwasher and the other dishwasher's empty. You, you retrieve the plates from the clean dishwasher, eat off them, put them in the empty dishwasher until eventually that's a full and dirty dishwasher and you turn it on and it's now your clean dishwasher. You don't need to unload your dishwasher if you have two dishwashers. How fucking cool is that? But it is completely non-obvious in advance. I think most creative progress is a bit like mountaineering in that the route up the mountain is obvious once you've got to the top, but it isn't obvious from the bottom. It's much easier to understand things in retrospect. We can post-rationalize almost anything, let's be honest. I mean, if humans have a, have a talent, it's for post-rationalization, okay? We can post-rationalize 10 times more than we can pre-rationalize. And as a result, demanding rationality of everything you try, in other words, going to the random bees and saying, you're going off to the northwest. We know that most of the pollen's in the southeast. What's your evidence base to support your direction of travel? is fundamentally a constraint on innovation, experimentation and discovery. I think quite a lot of huge breakthroughs are actually psychological, not technological. I think the big thing with Uber is the map. Okay? What Uber instinctively knew and then proved was true is people don't necessarily care that much about the duration of wait for a taxi. What they can't stand is the degree of uncertainty. Okay? And probably the best advice in my entire life was to go to British Airways and say, I can give you one thing which will transform passenger happiness. Never, if you can possibly avoid it, put BA flight 246 delayed. If you put delayed 47 minutes, no one cares. They're pretty happy. They're one or two like Swiss people who are ainly retentive, who'd be really upset about the delay, but most people go 47 minutes, I'll still make it to the meeting, I've allowed a bit of a margin of error, right? If you put delayed, Okay, what it is, is it's bad news, it's information that says something bad is happening, but we're not going to give you enough information to tell you what you can do in response. Now with Uber, you know, effectively, what you do is you go, it used to happen, you ordered a cab and you go, oh, oh God, maybe he's, maybe he's already left, maybe he couldn't find the house. Uh, I bet they lied, they said 15 minutes, I bet it isn't 15 minutes, maybe they haven't sent a ta cab at all. You know, uh, what's going on here? Oh God, uh, maybe he's parked around the corner. Basically, your whole time waiting for a cab was spent on tenderhooks. Once Uber brought in the map, it's basically, oh, look, he's stuck at those traffic lights. I'll have another pint. OK, so the duration of wait is the same. And it's easy to measure duration. What isn't easy to measure, because we don't have SI units for human emotions, what isn't easy to measure is the quality of the time spent. So we can measure quantities really easily, but qualities we don't have metrics for. Now, I would argue that actually nearly all really major innovations are driven by people who are actually a mixture of marketer and inventor. Jobs is as much a marketing genius as he is. Actually, I mean, the tech people at Apple didn't like Steve Jobs. Because I don't know what Steve does, he can't even code, right? All of these people, okay, my wife is a vicar and occasionally she gives me a bit of a hard time working in advertising. And I've got the perfect response, which is, Say what you like about marketing. I said, no one would have heard of Jesus if it hadn't been for St. Paul, okay? Doesn't matter how good your initial ideas are, you need someone to market them, all right? You need someone to take them out into the world. And I think, you know, all these people are part inventors, part marketing geniuses. And what we tend to do once the invention is successful is we forget the role that marketing played in actually in the initial success. All in innovation requires large-scale behavioral change. Behavioural change is difficult for people to do because the two strongest forces in human behaviour are habit and social copying. Do what I've done before, do what everybody else does. Okay? Don't look like a weirdo. Those are three really strong human instincts. And we forget, once a product becomes widely successful and habitual, we forget that the process was painful to begin with. 
I'm old enough at 56. I used a mobile phone on Oxford Street in 1989. It wasn't my own mobile phone. We had six in the company. We signed them out if we were going somewhere out of the, out of the building. And we left our colleagues our mobile number for the day. Walking along Oxford Street to Tottenham Court Road tube station, someone rang me. I had no choice. I answered the phone on Oxford Street. Two people shouted abuse at me from passing cars. Okay? I'm not making that up. That was 1989. Someone slides down the window of a taxi and goes, wanker, right? Because you're using a mobile phone on Oxford Street. We completely forget that early adopters pay a particularly high price for adopting a behavior first. They pay a high economic price, but they also pay a very high social price. That's the Bass diffusion curve, by the way. It explains why the adoption of technology is sigmoid. It's slow at first, then it reaches, then if it crosses the chasm, it reaches a large enough audience to become both habituated and socially normalized, at which point it grows very naturally until it reaches a kind of asymptote at the top. I think it's actually really important because how many products do we get wrong because we're asking, we are asking the question, how well is this selling? And I've got a suggestion here. I always thought Google gave up on Google Glass too soon. If Google still marketed Google Glass, they still sell it actually for technical B2B purposes. I would have bought it by now. I'd find Google Glass augmented reality really useful, right? I'd have a thing in my eye saying how long I had to left to talk to you. As it is, I've got a fucking clue, okay? Right, I've got a, right? Now, you know, I'd find Google Glass really, really useful. I would have bought it. Actually, I think the best question to ask with a new technology is how many people who buy it stick and how many people go back to not buying it? So I think I'm making a very big prediction here that electric cars are a very big thing. Yes, there are a minority of new cars being bought in the UK. The really significant factor with electric cars, which car manufacturers have to understand, is that people who go electric don't go back. Once you've made the switch, you never go back. Okay? There are lots of products like that. I've got a Japanese toilet, by the way. Now, this is going to be converting the UK to proper toilets is going to be a 50-year program. Personally, I think you're disgusting if you still wipe your ass with dry paper. I think it's absolutely barbaric. The whole of the Islamic world uses water. The Japanese, quite rightly, use water. Okay? You wouldn't pot a plant in the garden. Come in from the garden with earth on your hands and go, oh, look, I've got a bit of mud on my hands. Let me rub them vigorously with dry paper, right? You'd use water. But weirdly, when it comes to your ass, paper's fine, right? Now, interestingly, we did a bit of work with moist toilet wipes. And one of the things we realized is that we needed to normalize them. And we said to them, produce lots of... I was, <laughs> so I, I, was, I nearly said, produce moist toilet wipes in lots of different flavors. Flavors is the wrong word. I mean scents, okay? Not flavors, okay? Um, because if you have lots of different things on the shelf, you make it look normal. If you only have one thing of moist toilet paper, surrounded by tons of rolls of dry paper. People go, so normal people use dry paper, and then there's that one up there for the weirdos and people with a medical condition, right, okay? So one of the things we said is you've just got to get more facings. I wanted to do an experiment where you actually had a shop which was 50% moist, 50% dry, to see what effect that had on normalizing the behavior. I find this kind of stuff just fascinating. Nespresso, for example, was so unsuccessful to begin with that the only reason Nespresso survived is for two years they lied to Nestle about how much they were selling. The important fact about Nespresso is that once you've gone Nespresso, you never go back. I know that doesn't rhyme, but you get my point, okay? It's a ratchet technology. Moist, you know, automatic toilet paper, electric cars, mobile phones. You may know some weirdo without a mobile phone. I guarantee you don't know anybody who's had a mobile phone and then got rid of it, okay? And I think we probably give up on inventions far too early because we use aggregate sales as the measure. But if we know the Bass diffusion curve is non-linear, that's the wrong thing to look at. Because the sales of anything significantly new are going to be really slow to begin with. Car sales were really, really slow for the first 10 years. Okay? And I think understanding non-linearities and hidden asymmetries in what happens in human behavior, unless you understand those things, People doing the maths in marketing are going to get it really badly wrong. If you don't understand the way bees are doing it, 
There's a trade-off between explore and exploit. If you don't understand the fact that new technology adoption is unlikely to be a straight line, it's going to be slow at first. Actually, most companies tend to advertise when their sales take off. I would argue that if you think you've got a ratchet pro product, you should advertise before your sales took off. I spent years... There's nobody here from Philips, is there? I did my job, OK, as an agency person. I spent 10 years telling Philips to fucking well plug the air fryer. Who, who's an air fryer owner? Come on. OK, now, do you agree? This, this is the most marvellous, wonderful... OK, now, what will happen is all the air fryer people will gather together afterwards and, like, commune together like a cult before engaging in interesting air fryer enthusiast sex or something in the corner, right? Once you've gone air fryer, you never go back, OK? And yet, they, because air fryers weren't selling very much, they refused to spend any money marketing them. And I said, by the time you actually get your budget together, it'll be too late. Understanding asymmetries, understanding non-linearities is really important. I mentioned this about electric cars. The other thing is that the obstacles to innovation are mostly psychological, they're not technological. So if you look at electric cars, the biggest obstacle to electric cars is partly they're too expensive and the batteries are too big and they're too heavy. All of that is really a product of range anxiety. I would argue that range anxiety is mostly a relevant American fear that's been falsely imported into high-density populated countries like the UK or, or the Netherlands, OK? Even more so Singapore, right? I mean, how can you have range anxiety in Singapore? You'd have to drive around in circles 30 times before you'd even get remotely anxious, OK? But actually, there's a reason to have range anxiety in the US. They don't have trains. They only have 120 volts in their power supply. They get extremes of cold and extremes of heat. And, you know, you don't want to end up at a truck stop at 3 o'clock in the morning where the charger's broken down and your radio's telling you that a serial killer's just escaped from the local federal incarceration facility, right? In Britain, charging is basically you drive into Boston and the water, you, if the charger isn't working, there's another one in two miles, and you go and have some tea and scones while you're waiting for the car to charge. It's a fundamentally different thing, but what's happened is this fear has been Im irrationally imported. So I'll, e I'll end very quickly on this. Fundamentally, you have a different job as a marketer because what people in the business think they're doing, which is planning, which is dealing with the measures they can numerically quantify and which are directly within their realm of control, OK? Everybody in business wants to be doing that, except marketers, because marketers have to realise that value isn't created directly by those measures. It's by using those measures in a bizarre, creative and an unusual combination that you create value. I, I, I had a talk to a bunch of rail engineers. I said, what's the most important rail technology over the last 30 years? And they all answered things to do with points and safety and propulsion and high-speed rail and, high, and dedicated high-speed rail lines. I said, that's from a rail operator's point of view. That's from a top-down point of view. From a passenger's point of view, it's the table, OK? Because if you're on a train and there's a table, you can do things on a train journey, watch films, work, use a laptop, entertain yourself, eat, okay, which you can't do while you're driving a car. If you want people to get out of a car and into a train, it's not to do with time, duration, or any of the factors you like to measure and quantify. It's to do with what you can do when you're on the board. But that's a quality question, whereas punctuality and speed are a quantity question. And marketers are considered fluffy because we deal with things which you can't quantify. But the reason we do that is because you can't quantify the things that customers care about. There aren't SI units for the emotions. So I'll end very quickly. OK, I'll skip some of these uh, very interesting talks, because I've been told to. This is the kind of question that most business people like to answer. You have all the data you need to answer the question. Uh, well, actually, what is the answer? It'll be 50. So, so OK, the, 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 it, it's the 345 triangle, isn't it? Um, at 10 p.m., they'll be 100 kilometres apart. OK, right. There's only one correct answer to that. Now, in marketing, in psychology, it's not like that. The opposite of a good idea can be another good idea. OK? There's more than one correct answer, and the correct answer will not be a single numerical unit. Secondly, in that case, all the statistics you have are pointing in the right direction. This is a brilliant case, and I'll only be one more minute, I promise, Dan, okay? This was a case where they looked at 
all the bullet holes in planes in the US Air Force. And they said, obviously, the place to add extra weight and therefore extra armaments to the planes, extra armor plating, is where the bullet holes are. And they were about to do that. And a brilliant man called Abraham, I'm just trying to remember what his surname was, uh, an absolutely brilliant man at this US statistical department said, you've got it wrong. You're looking at the planes that made it back. The planes you need to be looking at are actually at the bottom of the English Channel. What I'm telling you to do is put the armament where the bullet holes aren't, because that's where a bullet kills a plane. What you've got is a data set of the places a plane can afford to get hit and still make it back to base. That's the other point. The thing that really worries me about the mass men movement, and I think, I think digital marketing has a whiff of thoroughness about it. I think it has a whiff of Elizabeth Holmes. I think we believe in digital marketing and performance marketing because we want to, not because it's true, okay? Genuinely, when you look at data from a marketing context, you have to actually uh, consider wider context. It's not a self-contained data set which tells you all you need to know. You need to know what are the biases, the asymmetries. What we do, I think, currently, and I'll end on this, is it's much more easy to get attribution for advertising effectiveness to something that's close to the bottom of the funnel. Because the information is attributable and it arrives quickly and it's inarguable. Okay? Long-term effects are very bad at provability because it's harder and harder to attribute to a single activity, a single consumer action, if there's a time taken between the stimulus and the response. And in many cases, in things like customer loyalty, the information may not even become apparent until the marketing director has moved on to another job. As a result, if we do things we can quantify, if we do things we can prove, we will, as a natural effect, become overly focused on the bottom of the funnel to the negligence of everything at the top. Because, and, and the, the, um, that's all I need to say, uh, except one more thing, actually. Yeah, read some of these books. And there was one more thing I wanted to say. I also think behavioral science can be interesting because we can start to create a taxonomy of human emotions. If we start to create almost units for regret, uncertainty, status, um, we can, it's never gonna become a perfect mathematical science, but at least we can start to create testing matrices for creative approaches alongside testing matrices for media approaches. At the moment, we're not doing it. And as a result, far too much effort is put into optimizing uh, what you might call the bottom of the funnel compared to the top, and far too much effort is put into optimizing targeting rather than optimizing creative, okay? Great targeting finds customers, great creative actually makes them. Now, it's very easy for the value of those two activities to look the same. In the short term, those two activities are equally valuable. Create a customer, find a customer. Okay? In terms of helping you keep your job, they're equally valuable. In the long term, terms of the long-term health of the business, the long-term thing is the creation of a customer is inordinately more valuable than merely the exploitation of something you know. So back to the bees, explore, exploit, trade-off. Always look at that whenever you look at anything. Thanks very much. Over Thank you. you. Oh. Well, Rory, what an incredible way to uh, end, the, uh, end the conference. I didn't expect to get into dishwasher life hacks, but I feel like I've learned something. I'm going to pitch that idea when I get home. So thank you for being such a brilliant audience. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. One if, question. Come on, go on. on, then. One question. Who's got a question? Anyone in the audience? Who's going to be brave? Rory wants a question. Excellent. It's Dom again. Yeah, sorry. Yep. Brilliant, Rory. Thank you so much. Uh, question, love the dilettante bees. Does that suggest that the concept of gut feel is actually more important than most kind of um, believe? I think you, I think you, I, I, I think what, what Charles Sanders Peirce would say is that some degree of human instinct has been optimized to asking the question, what would have to be true for this to happen? And the, that question is speculative and given, given that, um, I, I would say there are two, two ways you can do it in a way. I mean, 
There's instinct. And the other one is actually the right form of data appreciation. And what we tend to do is we tend to aggregate data. And as uh, Mark Ritson says, the average is the enemy of the marketer. Okay? Average information is great if you're reporting up to finance, because all they care about is how much in total. If you're a marketer, the information that's disproportionately valuable to you is something weird. Okay? Ray Kroc created McDonald's because he got an order for eight shake machines from one restaurant and he wanted to find out what was going on. He noticed an anomaly. And therefore, if someone accuses you of being anecdotal, you've got to be a bit careful about this because everything really important starts as an anecdote. You may need to investigate it, you may need to validate it, you may need to probe deeper, but actually it's exceptional outlier things that really teach us where the opportunity lies. The average doesn't teach us anything at all. Apart from else, the average customer doesn't really exist. There are very, very few markets where the average customer is a useful proxy for who your customers really are. Well, I think we should just put our hands together one last time for Rory. Thank you very much. A truly brilliant cool. lecture. Cool.